I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and I'm here with my co-host, Rebecca Wood, Yes, and we are bringing you For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about the environment and ecology. We talk about it in terms of how it affects you, your health, your happiness, your family, and we do it, and we try to do it in an upbeat way. We try to focus on the green future, the future that we should all be working towards and getting to. And uh, I was on my way in this morning, and it was dark, of course, and I was looking, and I could see the flames of the refinery over there in Oregon, and it's it, it's a little hard not to get depressed a bit when you're a green when you're a green and you when you're when you're someone who cares about the environment oh uh disclaimer i am the political director of the ohio green party but on this show i do not speak for the green party i'm speaking only for myself just like rebecca's speaking only for herself and you would be speaking only for yourselves if you call in at 866-240-1065 that's 866-240-1065 and so yeah i saw those flames dancing there and you know knowing that just watching them put tons and tons of carbon in just as I was driving in this morning. And I realized that what we need to do, we all know what we've got to do. We, the scientists have told us, but we just have to resolve to do it. We just have to resolve to stop putting carbon in the air. And so that, this being the first show of 2020, of the new year, I wanted to ask you, what are your eco New Year's resolutions? Um, what have you decided uh, this is the year that we're going to start X, that we're going to start doing something for the environment? And uh, so you can call in at 866-240-1065 and share that with us. Maybe you've decided this is the year you're going to start a garden, in your, or maybe this is the year uh, you're going to finally start that compost heap that you've been thinking about. Uh, maybe you're going to take a, a cool eco trip maybe down to costa rica or one of the national parks or or maybe even you've just decided to visit one of our local parks in wood county or lucas county or if you're down there in um, franklin county maybe you've just decided okay i'm going to the park once a week which is a fantastic thing to do health wise both mental and physical uh, what are your your 2020 eco Enviro New Year's resolutions. Give us a call and, and let us know. Now, one of the things, one of the things that makes the biggest difference in a person's carbon footprint during the year, or basically throughout their lives, is what kind of car are you driving? That's the question, uh, because personal transportation is one of the most carbon-intensive things that we do, and most of us in America have cars. Most of us drive cars. Uh, despite the, the expense, we had a guest on a few months ago who pointed out that just owning a car adds $10,000 expense per year for the average household. So you've decided, 
So if, if you've got a car, the question is, what kind of car are you going to have? And as you know, as if you're a regular listener, our household has decided that what we're going to have what, is a hybrid, a plug-in hybrid. We have a Chrysler Pacifica plug-in hybrid that gets, um, it can get up to 99 miles per gallon. Uh, right now I've got it up to around 40 or so. And our guest, we're going to have a guest starting about 8.15. It's a pre-recorded interview, but you can feel free to call in and ask questions. Our guest uh, is um, Aaron Miller, and Aaron has a both a Chrysler Pacifica hybrid and a uh, Tesla Model S. So he's going to talk to us. Because if you've resolved that this year your household, you're going to get a new car, this is the year you just have to finally buy that new car. And a lot of people are buying new cars this year. You, we would here on Ford Green Future, we would really like you to consider getting a hybrid or an electric or a plug-in hybrid. And so, so is our our resident uh, asker of naive questions. Yes. What's the price difference between hybrids and regular cars? Generally speaking, broadly speaking. Um. Well, that difference has been rapidly shrinking. Um, ah. It's it's actually down to just a, a few thousand dollars. I mean, uh, when we got our Pacifica, the hybrid version of the Pacifica cost less than the than an upscale version with a lot of uh, extra features and trim and stuff uh, of the regular Pacifica. And so so there's they're now overlapping. So you can get. And of a, course, you save some on gas. I'm sure that, that, that's money right there. Oh so. yeah, you save tons on gas. Yeah, I would think. So, uh, and for the most part, you save on on service too. But Aaron will talk about Aaron will talk all about that in uh, when he comes on. We're going to start playing his interview about 8:15 or so. Nice. So, how about you, Rebecca? Do you have any eco New Year's resolutions? Oh. I can't even recycle because we don't have it in the building where I live. Mm. It's a big government subsidized apartment building. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe. <laughs> I could try to cook with actual actual vegetables. That would be good. Yeah, that is that's good as opposed to plastic vegetables or. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I have some resistant. Well, that's I, that's probably what's in the pre- prepared foods that I like to use. But mm-hmm. I have some resistance because you know, I. The, the other person that I cook for does not like very many vegetables, just very select vegetables. I see. So, and some of the like mushrooms. I have a thing about mushrooms. I I don't like them. They mm. creep me out. It's mm. not even rational. Well, they're... so I have like the one, and that's like the one vegetable that she likes. So, well, <laughs> there onions and <clears throat> maybe green beans. I think. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Well, uh, mushrooms, of course, are saprophytic. So they saprophytic. Yeah, so that's a creepy sounding word. It is, yeah. But it just means that they have to get their their nutrients off of other things. They right. Don't, they don't generate them themselves. Right. So they don't photosynthesize. Is right. what that means. Right. So. so like, okay, wasn't there recently a study saying that they're actually more animal like than we realized and not very plant like? The fungi. Yeah. Yeah. The fungi as a group are. Yeah, they they can do weird things like uh, you know, like they can move. Like if you've heard about, if you heard of slime mold, I've heard of slime mold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't, can't say I, I I knew a guy actually who did his thesis on that and then oh, really? ceremonially burned it. Oh. At the end, just a, just a copy, you know. Oh, the copy of the thesis. Yeah. Oh, not the slime mold. That's going to say, no. Yeah, the slime mold is like fungus, and it you know grows and it's slimy, and you can see it. But um, if it gets dry, if it's in an area that's starting to dry out, the slime mold will coalesce itself into something that looks like a slug okay. and, and moves like a slug. Crazy. And I've then, never heard of that. Yeah, and then can actually crawl across the ground to find a, a damper spot. And then once it gets there, <laughs> then it, it de-slugifies itself and just spreads out into a, a slime mold again. So right. that's pretty animal-like. That is pretty animal Yeah, that's what I was, uh, bothers me about mushrooms. I feel like when I touch them, I feel like I'm touching dead flesh. Ooh. Mm. They have this corpse-like, I, I, okay. Yeah. That's enough okay. about All my right. personal weirdness, which has nothing to do with no, anything. No, because I, I love mushrooms, and, and, you know, yeah. and lots of people do. So we don't, we I'm don't probably wanna... not going to convince Joe anyway, so we might as well just move on. <laughs> yeah. So, um, right. Well, but as you could 
As you could tell, Rebecca and I are would be eagerly awaiting a call at 866-240-1065 on, on this show. What are your, your eco New Year's resolutions? So um, they don't have to be big. You know, you don't have to say this is the year that we're going to eliminate all plastic from my household. Maybe this is the year that you just start buying uh, more organic, you know, start buying more organic vegetables. That really helps the environment. Ooh, I know. I should use up those uh, lentils, the giant package of lentils that the soup kitchen gave us. <laughs> I should look up recipes and bloody well cook them. That's what I should do. There you are. Okay. Yeah. Use those lentils. Right. If only for the cupboard space. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's that's a, a pretty good, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an achievable, um, you know, these resolutions, sometimes people resolve to like, lose 150 pounds or something like that. I need to talk to some Ethiopians about that. I, mm. I went to a restaurant one time. They know their way around a lentil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Lentils are good. Lentils are, are a great food. So eat more lentils. So that's your eco resolution. I think All they right. taste kind of nice if you do them right, too. Mm-hmm. Well, our household, we're, we're trying to switch to more plant-based um, proteins, more of a plant-based diet than a meat-based diet. We're trying to Scaled back meat to maybe once or twice a week. Um, and okay, I've been seeing these memes coming up again on on uh, on on the facing book all about um, how actually oh when you eat your avocado toast or you eat your vegetables the environment's destroyed for those two. But I'm pretty sure that is not actually true because when you when you feed say some soybeans to a cow and then you eat the cow the the, the cow burns off a lot of energy by walking around and farting and things and oh yeah yeah that's so it takes ends yeah. up taking more a bigger area of clear land to feed the cow than it would to just if you just like ate the food directly from the ground exactly yeah in fact um i mean farming does have an impact even if it is uh even if it's organic farming there is still an environmental impact but <clears throat> uh it takes one tenth the the space one tenth Ooh, the energy that's a lot I thought it was like a third or something that's that's crazy yeah no so so yes you're having an impact but you're having a tenth of the impact as if you were having a you know sausage patty or a yeah or a hamburger for breakfast so. my my brain tends to just re- reject numbers like a bad kidney unless I write them down and keep them right in front of me mm-hmm. right but um coming back to the idea of you know if this is the year that you're gonna get a new car. I think you should make it a hybrid, and and or a and I'm not the only one. See, one of the main reasons I wanted to interview this uh, this fella is because he's a real Chrysler Pacifica fan, and you know, I know sometimes you tease me about that. Well, I'm I'm not the only one. And before we go into it, I want to say I want to point out that neither of us are getting any kind of Joe has an unseemly emotional attraction <laughs> d- 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 attachment to his hybrid. I'm yeah, telling you. well. <laughs> I, I'm afraid I do, but but I, but I want to tell you, I want to make sure the audience Although knows. Although there are that, worse things you could attach yourself to emotionally, I suppose. Well, yeah, I could think At least of some. It's useful. I could think of some people that I wouldn't want to attach there we myself to. Yeah, exactly, to right. Yeah. Um, but uh, I want to assure the audience that neither of us are getting any kind of reimbursement for this. We're, there's going to be some gushing on here, but it's not. Uh, yeah. Not because we're getting paid, unfortunately. Right. I mean, I've it's actually just, it's just like a hobby with him. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think they should be subsidizing. I think they should be supporting shows they like should. this one. Call us, but they're not terribly uh, interested in promoting the hybrid. It seems right. as much as they are the regular uh, internal combustion cars. Well, anyway, so without further ado or interrupt, interruption, here is the. Uh, interview with Aaron Miller, and if you'd like to call in during the interview, feel free. We'll, we'll pause the interview and take your call. Hybrids are sort of the Boo Radley of, of uh, cars in the in the <laughs> Chrysler family. Yeah, <laughs> no, like nobody likes and, to talk about them. Right. But, yeah. Okay. Pretend they don't exist. All right, Russell, <laughs> let's hear it. Hello. Well, Aaron Miller, welcome to For a Green Future. Um and uh, I've invited you on because I know that you are very enthusiastic about hybrid and electric cars, and you own both a Tesla and a Chrysler Pacifica. And I wanted I talk about my Chrysler Pacifica quite a bit on this show, and I just wanted people to know that I'm I'm not the only one, that there's actually a whole community of Chrysler Pacifica enthusiasts out there. 
And in fact, you have a Facebook page uh, with about four, more than 4,000 members uh, from Chrysler Pacifica owners all over the world, actually. Uh, what's what's the name of your Facebook group? Uh, it's 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 pretty generic. It's uh, uh, Pacifica Hybrid uh, Owners 2017 and Beyond, and it's just to encompass uh, all enthusiasts who are either currently owning or looking to own the Pacifica Hybrid. Um, and one thing to note, the 2017 was the first year that Chrysler offered the plug-in hybrid Chrysler Pacifica. Right, and uh, it's a great car. Uh, what what do you like about your Pacifica, and what drew you to the Pacifica? So I have a family of, of six, so that pretty much leaves the minivans and very large SUVs as our ride options. Um, but prior to owning our Pacifica Hybrid, I already owned a Tesla Model S. So I was already used to uh, the electric world, uh, how an e electric vehicle drives, how it handles, things like that. And my wife and I both uh, had kind of come to really prefer it. Um, so we were in the market for a new vehicle, and knowing it was going to be the family vehicle, you know, it really limits what options are available. And then digging in a little bit further, you'll find out that the Pacifica Hybrid is the only plug-in hybrid electric vehicle that is capable of seating six people. If you look at the, the world of all the minivans that are out there and all the large SUVs out there, the Pacifica Hybrid is the only plug-in electric vehicle. Um, so the one, the one nuance to note here is that the difference between just a hybrid vehicle and a plug-in hybrid vehicle is that a plug-in hybrid vehicle plugs into the wall, uh, the car charges a battery from power uh, drawn from the wall, and it uses that stored battery power to uh, electrically propel your vehicle. Uh, it, by comparison, a hybrid vehicle, uh, the engine, the gasoline engine always runs, and it uses... Um, electricity generated by the engine to propel the vehicle. So the plug-in hybrid uh, gives you the opportunity to drive without using any gasoline at all. Uh-huh. And, and so you've actually managed to do that a fair bit, drive without using gasoline. What's what's the longest you've managed to go between Phillips with your Pacifica? The longest we went was two months. Um, uh, a little over, uh, in 2018, uh, we went the entire month of April and May without filling up at the gas station. Wow. Well, th and that's, that's a great, <laughs> that's a great savings in operation cost. I mean, the cost of electricity versus the cost of gasoline, wouldn't you say? Oh, so I do a lot more analyzing with my, my Tesla than I do my minivan, but um, 40, uh, $40 in electricity in my Tesla gets me almost 1,000 miles. And comparatively, you know, we were on one tank of gas in our Pacifica Hybrid for two months. When was the last time anybody drove a minivan on one tank for two months? And just as a reference point, that was 1,500 miles. Wow. Now, granted, we were pulling electricity from the wall, but still, that one tank of gas lasted us 1,500 miles. And that's really the beauty, the beauty of, the, of a plug-in vehicle is you plug in the vehicle when you're home, when you're not using it, and then when you go to use it again, it's full. You know, I tell people it's like your cell phone. You plug it in. And in the morning when you wake up, it's full. You don't know how long it took to get there. You just know that it's full and ready to go every time you need it. Oh, that's great. It, and you're not giving up comfort, right? One of the points I like to make on For a Green Future is that the green future isn't one of privation. You're not going to have to cramp yourself into a tiny little car with no uh, AC or, or heating to it. I mean, the, the, you are. it's a comfortable car. The, so one thing to note about um, electrified vehicles,
vehicles. And when I say electrified vehicles, I mean vehicles that have a large battery, high voltage battery in them intended to propel the vehicle is typically the battery is stored in the floor of the vehicle. And so that extra weight in the bottom of the vehicle really changes the way that the vehicle drives. And this is true for, for any electric vehicle. Um, Chrysler talks about how in the Pacifica hybrid, they had to use a more robust suspension system. And so one of my favorite aspects of electric vehicles, and this is true for all the Teslas that I've driven and the Pacifica hybrid, is that a, a vehicle, when it's driving in an electric mode, it just kind of floats or glides. Like the extra weight in the floor just allows the vehicle to just ride more smoothly across the road. And um, the the Pacifica Hybrid, we've my family has owned numerous minivans in the past. It's the most uh, technologically advanced vehicle uh, minivan we've ever owned. Um, it's uh, the 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 seats are incredibly plush, incredibly comfortable. Uh, the ride is very smooth, and um, it is uh, hands down one of the most comfortable rides I've ever had in my life. Hmm. Now you uh, you also own your your Tesla S. Um, so what's it like driving a, a a Tesla compared to the Pacifica compared to a, an internal combustion engine? So the first thing you'll notice about any uh, any any vehicle uh, that is an electric vehicle is just the instant power. Um, huh. Tesla's hand, Tesla's hands down are the funnest vehicles I've ever driven. I don't know if I will ever not own a Tesla, just based on my experience with Teslas. And um, but they they're just they're fun to drive. They're cheap to drive. Like outside of the cost of a vehicle, you know, I mean, we're looking at with the Pacifica Hybrid, you can get a fully loaded Pacifica Hybrid for almost fifty thousand dollars. Everybody knows you can get a fully loaded uh, Tesla for over a hundred thousand dollars. So, I mean, these vehicles aren't just a small everyday purchase. Um, but the but the reality is, is all the savings that come with them. Um, you know, I've had my my Tesla for almost sixty thousand miles. And the only thing that I've had to buy is a is a 12 volt battery, which is in every vehicle that's on the road. And I've had to buy new tires. There's no oil changes. There's no fluids to change. There's you know no maintenance, um, and they're just incredibly cheap to own. And the other thing about uh, about vehicles that have electric capabilities is there more and more variety is coming around. You know, so many people, I, I used to joke with people that um, whenever a manufacturer would decide to make an electric vehicle, they would design the ugliest possible vehicle they could <laughs> they could design, and then they'd throw a battery under it and put electric motors in it. That's just, that's just, I mean, it's slow, don't get me wrong, but it's becoming not the case. You know, the, the Pacifica Hybrid the only way you can tell that it's a Pacifica hybrid versus a regular Pacifica is the charge door on the driver's side of the van and the hybrid badging on the back. Other than that, they're, they look exactly the same. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, there, that, are, there are still... Yeah, that, that, that hybrid uh, badge on the back, I've always, I've always, I think that's too small. You know, I, I'm thinking that should be like a six-inch by eight-inch thing saying hybrid instead of this tiny little little metal thing that just says hybrid but uh but <laughs> but a lot of people you know are you know that i reported last week the statistic is uh 20 percent of americans right now are looking at their next car being a, a hybrid or or an electric vehicle and so a lot of them aren't a lot of people just don't know what the first step is they don't know how to start looking for an electric car what what would you tell people in that situation My first, my, the first thing that I would tell people is keep an open mind, because especially in 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 today's day and age, more and more vehicles are becoming available. It's not just the small little, um, the small little vehicle that you can barely.
really fit three people in anymore. Uh, just this last week, uh, uh, Jeep announced three vehicles that'll have the, a similar system, uh, plug-in hybrid system as the Pacifica. So that's like your traditional Jeep Wrangler that everybody thinks of as the off-road beast is going to be electric. Same thing. You'll be able to drive for a certain period, for a certain distance solely on electric. Um, so there are options out there from, from SUVs like the, the, the Ram 4 and, and now a couple of Jeep options to vehicles such as like the, um, Honda Clarity, which is a mid-sized vehicle. Um, similar to, I would put it somewhere between a Civic and an Accord, but it's in that, in that, that ballpark. So they're not just like small clown cars anymore. They're normal everyday vehicles. Um, Ford used to have the Ford Fusion electric, or I think they called it the Energy, which was a Ford Fusion, just like the Pacifica Hybrid or a Ford Fusion they could plug in. So more and more options are coming. I always used to joke, why can't they just design their vehicle like they would any other vehicle and then throw a battery in it? And more and more manufacturers are starting to do that. Instead of trying to recreate the wheel, they're just saying, well, let's just take what we got, a la the, 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 the Jeep Compass, I believe, was announced, maybe the Renegade and the Wrangler. So vehicles they already have, they're just putting an electrified system in. Mm-hmm. So first, there's really a lot of options. Don't make yourself believe that you only have a couple choices and that you are going to be forced to get something that you don't want just to get an electric vehicle. Uh, the second thing to consider is that um, really the average person, uh, now don't get me wrong, I know that there are exceptions to everything, but the average person is foolish for not owning a plug-in vehicle. Look at the world events today with with everything going on in Iran and Iraq uh, over the last couple of days. Oil prices have spiked 5% in the last 24 hours. That is directly going to impact you at the gas pump. But if you own an electrified vehicle, electric rates stay the same. Our electric rates have been about 12 kilowatt hour, uh, 12 cents per kilowatt hour for the last years, as long as I can remember here in Northwest Ohio. Talk about a talk about a benefit for budgeting when you know exactly how much your fuel is going to cost. Um, so predictability is a benefit, but the other benefit is when you're driving a plug-in uh, plug-in vehicle, you still have unlimited range. Once your battery runs out, the gas engine turns on and the car keeps driving. There's absolutely nothing for the owner to think about. They just keep driving. You still have the option to just fill it up at the gas station if you don't want to plug it in, or maybe you're not able to plug it in. But still, these hybrid systems are more efficient. Um, the energy that is uh, created by the engine is stored in the battery for later use. So even once your your initial battery charge has run out, owners still find that their vehicle is able to have um, solely electric miles on their trip, simply because energy is being created by the gas engine, it's being stored in the battery, and it's being used as efficiently as possible. So really, there's an even better benefit, because when you're sitting at a red light in your regular vehicle, your engine's just running, versus when you're sitting at a red light in a plug-in plug in hybrid vehicle, when your engine's running, it's charging the battery that propels your vehicle. Mm-hmm. The most inefficient time for a gas engine are under extreme load. The most common extreme load is when you are uh, uh, getting up and going from a, like a red light. So very frequently, even when your battery is depleted, you will find that the your vehicle is still able to get up and go from a red light using strictly electric power, which is a huge savings on uh, on your gas bill at the pump. Yeah, um, it's it's pretty the, cool. The last thing that I would, it, it is cool. You know, it's just and these systems are so. I I tell people, you know, think of your mom's kitchen. Ask yourself if she has one of those little electric 
hand uh, hand uh, mixers, the, 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 like what you'd mix a, a bowl of brownies up with. Odds are she does, and odds are she's had it since like 1950. But the thing just works. And it's the same technology. It's an electric motor that spins. Mm-hmm. It's just a little bit bigger for the van. But it's the same exact technology, and it's been proven over and over again all throughout our, our, our lifetime. We just, uh, it's something different when it's in a vehicle, and so we have a hard time really saying, like, is it okay? Even though it's, you know, like, like look at um, look at train locomotives. They're powered by electric, by electric motors. They use a they use a, a diesel engine to create a to create electricity, but the actual motor that drives the locomotive is an electric motor. <laughs> so trains trains are hybrids then, just like yeah 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 that's that's cool. I don't think trains have a big battery pack, but they're still using electric motors. Yeah, well, actually, I think they do have a pretty good a pretty good sized battery because. Uh, I know I used to do uh, wind and solar power. Uh, I had a business installing it, and what some home solar people did was uh, they would get those old train batteries and basically hook them up to their solar panels, and they could ch- get enough charge to run the entire house off of that. So. Oh wow. Yeah, but um, so you've been an enthusiast about uh, hybrids and electrics for a long time, and you know what. I mean, I think that the internal combustion engine is on its way out, whether people want to admit it or not. But I, I think, you know, I want to again press home the point that the transition to an, to electric vehicles is actually an improvement. That they're more comfortable, they they run better, they run longer, they run cheaper, and so this is not like oh, mourning the loss of internal combustion, mourning the loss of all that that uh, exhaust and all that carbon we're putting into the air. It's more like being happy about this this even better technology that's come along. Well, and 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 look at where look at where we were probably you know a little over a hundred years ago, when everybody was walking around with with their their horse and their buggy, and the first people started driving around with these cars with these internal combustion engines, you know, and somebody was probably sitting there thinking, you know, my horse just walks. But that engine's got like 5,000 pieces in it, and if any one of those pieces breaks, that whole car is just done. And there are probably a ton of people who are in the same position we are in today. You know, we've had internal combustion engines for a while. They just, you know, for the most part, they work. We know that things things happen. You know, we, 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 we've had them long enough that we know the timing of things. Certain things happen at certain mile intervals. You expect um, to start having to put money into a car once it hits about 100,000 miles because things are just going to wear out. And now we have something new, something different. So it's just it's, it's just being willing to open our mind to embrace something that, while it's different from what we're used to, when you cross over to the other side, you discover that it's it's better. All right. It's, well, it's that, funny. well, that's a you know that's a great that's a great note to end the interview on, Aaron. I, I think uh, you kind of summed it up there. Aaron Miller, thanks so much for being our guest. And uh, you know, if you're do, well, making my a, pleasure, yeah. If you're making a New Year's resolution and you're thinking about getting a new car in 2020, why not get a 2020 car? Why not get something that's a hybrid? or an electric, or or a plug-in hybrid, and you get the best of both worlds. So, all right, Aaron, thanks so much. And, uh, yeah, it's been been a pleasure. And here we are back again live, and you can join us at any time at 866-240-1065. Still waiting to hear what your Enviro New Year resolution is for 2020, because 2020, I mean, this year just sounds like the future, doesn't it? I mean... People talk. Kind of does. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I remember I was, you know, I was alive back in the old 20th century, and the year 2000 was kind of like out there. I was like, are we actually going to make it to 2000? But 2020, I mean, then you were talking 
like Star Trek stuff. We were trying, it's almost unimaginable. Uh, but here we are, 2020, and yet a lot of us, most of us, are still driving those same sorts of internal combustion engines that we were back when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s. And I would just like to point out, I've known people who have horses. Actually, parts of horses break down a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I call a vet for them all the time. Well, that's true, but uh, I think horses can have have a role in our, our future transportation systems. There you, you know? go. Yeah, they're they're cool. I like I like horses. Um, but so as I said, uh, all that gushing endorsement of cars and stuff, none of that was uh, reimbursed, and yet we do have some sponsors on this show, and I'd like to talk about them now. The first sponsor is the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, they provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead you on outdoor adventures. The Wood County Parks protects 20 parks and nature preserves all around Wood County, which is just south of Toledo, and they are open from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every single day of the year couple ways to get a hold of them. One is to call at 419-353-1897. Another is to go to their website, wcparks.org. And they also have an app. Just go to your app store and search for WC Parks. And using that app, I discovered an event they're going to have this week that I'd like to announce. Um, on January 8th, that's this coming Wednesday, from 1 to 4 p.m., at the Carter Historic Farms, located at 18331 Carter Road in Bowling Green. They're going to have a beginning spinning course. Uh, They're going to teach people how to spin yarn. And it only costs $10. And you go on the website to pre-register. And that's uh, 1 to 4, Wednesday, January 8th, if you want to learn how to spin, which I understand from people who do it is a wonderfully relaxing kind of thing. It's kind of cool. It's repetitive. If you like repetitive, spinning's where it's at. <laughs> oh, so you have, you have spun? They taught us in uh, it was the eighth grade art class or something. Oh, and, okay. All right. Yeah, we, well, we had a unit on that. All right, well, the <laughs> fundamentals are still the same. So um, so our other sponsor for this hour is DeMar Consulting. DeMar Consulting is a computer consulting company, and they will come to your home. They'll help you with any sort of computer problem that you have, whether or not your hard drive is working, or perhaps you need some help installing or or using some sort of software that you've purchased, Uh, DeMar Consulting will come out and help you. They are, um, everyone at DeMar Consulting has a degree in computer science, and so they, you know that they know what they're talking about. And unfortunately, I have to announce that this is the last uh, ad for DeMar Consulting we'll be doing, because they are moving out of state. They're they're shutting up their operation and heading over to Colorado, actually. So um, this, if you've been meaning, if you, you know, what are your resolutions has been, oh, I'm going to call that DeMar Consulting and, and get that thing fixed before this year. You know, this is your last chance, basically. They're only going to be operating for a few more weeks before shutting down. So you can call them at 419-973-3000. That's 419-973-3000. Or you can go to their website, demarconsulting.com, D-E-M-A-R-E, and then the word consulting.com. Demar Consulting for all your computing needs. There you go. All right. Well, now we've come to the part of the show where we like to talk a little bit about environmental news, about environmental stories that are that are in the news. And uh, those of you who, you know, are tuned into 106.5 FM, the ticket, hoping for sports. Don't worry, Mick Gonzalez and the cheap seats are on their way. They'll be back at 9 o'clock, and uh, you'll get, you know, plunging back into sports. But just for a little while longer, we're going to be talking about things environmental and things ecological. And there's just a couple stories I wanted to go over this week uh, before we get to our letter to the future, from the future, our letter from the future. That'll be a little bit later. Ooh, should we also mention how people can uh, agree to sponsor the show? Yeah, they want to? We will we will mention that. Okay. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> and uh we really need some patrons. So if you could go to patreon.com, that's P A T R E O N. If you want to support For a Green Future, just go to that website, search for For a Green Future, and a nice screen will pop up 
and it'll show you different levels of membership that you can, and then once a month you can sign up and they'll, it'll just be automatically deducted from your checking account. And, you know, we live in a time when a whole bunch of things are doing this, you know, there's this little thing for a dollar something a month and this little thing for three fifty a month and and you've probably got all sorts of these little things attached to your checking account already, maybe for things you don't even actually use. Like little moray eels sucking right. dry. <laughs> so so instead of having these, these little things that like are expenses and you know, maybe you should think about becoming a patron of for a green future and then every month you can like feel good and say, Aha, there's that there's that five dollars a month, or there's that ten dollars a month. I'm putting towards a green future, so that's it's more of an investment than a than an expense, really. So, um, yep. So, please consider becoming a patron. All right. Now on to the news, and uh, I, there, NBC had a story that I wanted to talk about. It was aired. It, they published it on uh, January second. And it's a story about a woman named Susan Wind who was living in Mooresville, North Carolina. And her daughter came down with thyroid cancer, which is a a terrible thing. And then she discovered that there's actually a cancer cluster there in Mooresville, North Carolina. And so she raised a whole bunch of money and went to the local university and said to the, you know, science professors there, Let's figure out what's going on. She raised over $100,000 from her friends and neighbors, and so that they started doing this study. But there was something about this study and about the – what they haven't published their conclusions yet, but they, they've already published – they've already said some things publicly about the study that they're doing. And one of the things they said was that, well, there's a – turns out there's a nuclear plant there in Mooresville, North Carolina. And if you've been following the show, you know that there have been many studies that show nuclear that thyroid cancer doubles within five miles of a nuclear plant. But the teachers, the professors that are doing this study uh, for this $100,000 have already said they've discounted the nuke plant as the cause of the radi- of the increased thyroid cancers and the quote is, because they found no evidence of increased radiation. The problem with that is that nuclear plants release radiation in the normal course of their operation. Every time they have to refuel, they vent radioactive gases, including radioactive iodine, out into the environment. And it's a discrete event. And so it's not what you'd call increased radiation in terms of unexpected radiation they've got they get permits for it they're allowed to do it um, so in terms of regulations in terms of the official uh, story that radiation somehow just doesn't count but um, no one apparently remembered to tell the thyroids that this is this is different from unplanned radiation so it shouldn't bother them that's right no yeah, yeah they, they should have sent some sort of letter to you know Bill's thyroid. They think it's just like regular, regular radiation, and yeah, I get cancer. And they can't, <laughs> yeah, somehow they can't tell the difference yeah. between permitted radiation and, and unpermitted radiation. So, so what I want, the reason I wanted to point this study out um, is that there's an effort, sometimes researchers go so far to try to say, oh, well, we're not biased, we're not going to draw any conclusions. They go so far in that direction that they actually create a bias against what's actually going on. Um, so in, in the effort to stay, quote, unquote, neutral, they become biased in the other direction. Can you so, prove that that thing that looks and talks like a duck is not actually a Bengal tiger? Right. Beyond right. all shadow of a doubt. Right. Maybe and it's a new species of Bengal tiger. And they say we're not going to. It looks like ducks. They're, they're not going to say we're, we're not going to assume that's a duck. Right. Just because <laughs> it has a beak and it feathers and it, you know, we're going to go through the entire animal kingdom, and you know, if somebody like forces us to look and say, okay, that is a duck, then maybe we'll admit it. <laughs> right. But um, but yeah. So now there is a little bit of um, 
there are some other circumstances down there in Mooresville, North Carolina. They do ha- also have a huge coal ash dump, uh, which coal ash does have radioactivity in it. There was a 2015 study that showed radiation concentrated in, in coal ash. So, and then in Mooresville, they actually use their coal ash to pave roads and, and fill potholes. And so they've distributed it throughout the, the community. Oopsie daisy. Yeah. So that that could be a factor there too. But to, to say, no, it's definitely not the nuke. If you're searching for evidence of increased radiation, you have to be outside the nuclear plant when it vents the radiation. Otherwise, you're, you're just going to miss it. It's going to be in the background and but and you also but the other thing you have to do is ignore all the studies that have come from places like Europe that show thyroid cancers doubling in the proximity to nuke plants so um that that just that story just kind of caught my eye and the the, the bias in it I kind of wanted to point it out point it out but that happens a lot with environmental stories. But Joe, not to worry, Joe reassured me in the car on the way here that uh, actually someone is watching the level of radiation uh, or, uh, around nuclear plants and reporting to the government. Guess who it is? <laughs> it's the owners of the nuke plants. <laughs> See, so problem solved. <laughs> yeah, right. And so, of course, they're going to immediately report any anomalous radiation because yeah. then they'll, they'll, they'll want to, they want to get those fines and penalties, you know, and they want to, you know, get the attention of the NRC. So if there's any ever anything that goes wrong, they immediately hop on the phone and... The fox will yeah. keep the hen house nice and safe, no worries. All right. Well, and then, but actually, of course, there have been many documented cases where mm. there were releases and the, the utility, the owner of the plant didn't report for months or sometimes even years and then they, then they would go back and, oh, yeah, like eight months ago we did have this or that. Oh, yeah, we forgot um, about but that. But we fixed Sorry. that problem. Yeah. Hey, let's move on. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Now, another story uh, that – now, this uh, this is an interesting story. Well, actually, I think what we're going to do is we're going to go to the letter from the future first, and then we'll go to the second story. So, we got to make sure we get that over with. Right. Sure. Whatever else we do. We're running low on time, and last week we ran right up against it, so this week I want to be sure. All right. So, dear great-great-grandpa, greetings from the year 2300. It feels so strange to say that. I've always known that the year 2300 was coming, but now that it's actually here, it really does feel like I'm living in the future. Of course, I've always been living 280 years in your future. The New Year's Eve party here on Mars Colony was incredible. Martians have a reputation for being partiers, and let me tell you, it's true. (laughs) The parties went on till 4 in the morning. My brother Sam slipped away with some woman I'd never met before around 2. We're not at the main colony anymore. We're out at the Rachel Carson Colony. That's where they have a drilling project similar to the one we have on the Kola Peninsula. Scientists and engineers are drilling a research hole as deep as they can to learn as much about Mars as they can. It's really impressive. With Mars' lower gravity, there's less pressure on the drill, and they've been able to drill deeper and faster. I, of course, am interested in the bacteria colonies that live deep and underground on Mars. It's looking like Mars may be dead below the surface. On Earth, there are bacteria very deep in the crust and even in the mantle. Martian scientists have been reporting that deep underground Mars is sterile. But we know the surface isn't sterile. It's got a mix of Earth and Martian bacteria. In fact, I told you that I've been having trouble getting scheduled for lab time. Well, on my way back to my room after the New Year's party, I passed by the science lab. No one was in there, and they don't lock doors on Mars. So I went back to my room, got those samples I told you about, went back to the lab and started culturing them. No one else in the whole colony was even awake at that hour. I think everybody was sleeping off the partying. So I should have some interesting results to tell you about next week, GGG. I really enjoy writing you. Keep up the good work. Love, Marie I. Hey. Yeah. And I want to remind people that you can also write to Marie I because, you know, I have a correspondence going with her. Um, her, They have a, a chest of letters that I've written to her, and every week she opens one. So she's getting... Oh. Correspondence for B as she's sending correspondence back in time to us. So if you have any questions about the green future, don't hesitate to to email us at uh, joe at joe demar for our green future dot org, and we'll pass them on to Marie I and get them answered. 
All right, so but back to the present. And uh, the second story I wanted to talk to you guys about was uh, December 24th, New York Times published a story. Back in 2017, we've reported on this before, Trump's Fish and Wildlife Service rewrote the Migratory Bird Act, um, the, the Migratory Bird Treaty of 1918. And what they did was they said, from now on, unless a company is purposefully, deliberately killing birds, there's no penalty for killing birds. Now, prior, prior to that, that law was used to protect animals in case of development. So, like, um, if you were going to have a development that was going to wipe out a, a wetland area, you would have to build another wetland area for the birds that were nesting in that first area. So it's a little bit like if manslaughter was no ne- not a crime anymore. Like if you, the the rule in law is if you do something which is likely to carelessly result in the death of a person, this is not quite as bad as if you set out to kill them, but still forbidden. That's right. It's <laughs> yeah. It's basically saying murder is still a crime. You can't send your employees out with sticks to go kill birds. Right. But manslaughter is no longer a crime. If if you're just you know doing whatever you do for your business. And you kill all the birds. Oh, well. That doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. And so two years in, looking at this Trump policy, and it is disastrous. They are, you know, Trump can now take credit for the bird apocalypse. Um, I mean, he was crying alligator tears about wind turbines killing birds. Yeah, he's real concerned about that. But he actually personally, with this change in the, the law, has killed millions of birds around the country. Um Many, many times more than all the wind turbines in the country have put together. Well, maybe he just doesn't like the competition. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's afraid. I don't know. But uh, they gave a, an example of how this works. Um, there was a Chesapeake Bay development. They want to build a. They want to expand a, a traffic tunnel, and so it would mean covering up, paving over an area where there's about twenty-five thousand nesting seabirds. And it turns out that this is actually literally the last place on Chesapeake Bay where these birds can nest. And so the state of Virginia and the developers of the tunnel were like, okay, well, we'll build an artificial island, right, adjacent to the one we're about to wipe out. The birds can nest there. And they were all set, and they had budgeted for it, and they were starting to you know, get the contractors to do it. Trump's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service steps in and says, don't do it says, because this is the, the, the Treaty of 1918 no longer applies here. You don't need to spend that money. You know, don't save those birds. So they couldn't even bother to just l- not let them know. Right. No, the, the Trump administration is actively preventing mitigations uh, for, bird, for bird losses. Okay, how did this happen? Was this an act of Congress, or is it just his interpretation of the rules somehow? It was just Trump, his interpretation. The high and mighty just said, you know what? We don't need to we don't need to consider anything but deliberate takings. And so uh, so this is the result is, is is Trump personally can be is a large part responsible for the bird apocalypse in, in the United States of America. And, uh, you know, I think they can rename the Fish and Wildlife Service to maybe the Fish and Wildlife Elimination Service. or um, Yeah, so this is. It's a terrible story that I, I think it's important that everybody know going in because this is a time when we're going to be asked to choose again. Uh, and, you know, the choice is somebody who, who essentially wants to wipe out our wildlife. And he's shown that over and over again. We had guests on talking about the Endangered Species Act. And we're going to have um, some more guests coming up here soon about habitat destruction. But I think... You know, he did it. He got away with it. There was uh, a little bit of an outcry back in 2017 when he did it. But it's important to go back and look at the effects of having done it because. Right. It's part of the, the ongoing uh, animal horror human called a uh, horror film called The Humans. <laughs> well, <laughs> you some... notice that how we're always making horror films about animals doing terrible things to us. But. Mm. When it turns out we're actually doing it to them, it's a projection. They call that projection in oh. psychology. <laughs> yeah. Wow. If they, if they 
Right, right. If if the wildlife were making movies about humans, those those would be really scary. Yeah. It would be endless supply of material. But uh, I I would prefer to think of that as some humans because I mean a lot of people spent a lot of time protecting birds. You know, decades and decades. Shoot. Almost a hundred years. Well, actually, it is almost exactly a hundred years, years. Exactly, almost even of protection for birds from this law. Yeah. And so, you know, thousands of people have been involved over that hundreds of years, saving birds, protecting their habitat, and then Trump just wiped it all out with a stroke of a pen. So, um, and there was one other thing I wanted to mention about. We were talking last week in terms of uh, 2019, the top environmental story being the year that the earth burned and we were pointing out that places like Australia and Africa and uh, a lot of places that started with A were burning. Well, there there was another very important place that we missed in that and that is the Arctic. Yep. 2019 was the year that the Arctic burned and when the Arctic burns, it's not like the dramatic forest fires that they have in, in places like Australia or the Congo, or the Amazon, uh, the ground itself burns because that's where all the organic material has been building up for the past 10,000 years. And so burning that releases incredible amounts of CO2 into the air. And um, so, (laughs) in fact, the Arctic burned in Siberia. They lost over 5 million acres. It burned in Alaska. Uh, They had record forest fires in Alaska, and it burned wow. in uh, Canada. So the whole Arctic was burning the, in 2019. And if you think when you go to fill up your car, you know, this carbon that I'm putting into my car, is that going to make things like that worse? The answer is yes. Yes, it is. And so one thing we want you to do on Four Green Futures this year, resolve not to do that anymore. Please think you welcome. Yeah. Rely, use public transportation when you can. And if you're going to buy a new car... Buy a hybrid. All right. Well, I hear the theme song going. Rebecca, thanks so much for co-hosting this episode. Thank you all for listening. Mick Gonzalez and the Cheap Seats are on their way back. This is Joe DeMar signing off.